Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Entertainment Network. I am your host, Sarah. I am very excited to be with you again today to bring you my second author interview of the week. Have a great interview to share with you today. As we get started, I would like to remind you, if you haven't done so already, to like and follow like, follow, subscribe uh, to this podcast, however you are watching or listening to it. That is really helpful, helps us to get the podcast out to more readers such as yourselves. Uh, In addition to that, as we get started, I would also like to remind you that if you are a fan of the podcast and you have the inclination to be helpful to the podcast in other ways, you can leave a tip or a donation by going to gsmcpodcast.info. You see that link next to me. I always tip my head the wrong way because I'm not used to the camera, apparently. Um, So you can see that link, gsmcpodcast.info. If you go to that website, you can leave a tip or donation for the show. Again, every little bit helps. I am so appreciative of all the support that I have been given um, by my listeners over the years. So thank you for that. Thank you in advance for anything that you do going forward. As I said, I have a great interview for you today. Uh, Before we do that, I would just like to see how your week has been. It is Friday and it is, uh, hopefully you've got some good plans for the weekend. Today actually happens to be my birthday. So I'm getting this episode up and then my hubby and I are going to go on hopefully a long walk. It's, 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 beautifully sunny out there today, but it's also really, really windy. So we'll see how the walk goes. Um, But hopefully we are going to have a good long walk with the dogs and then we are hanging out with some friends of ours tonight. I am looking forward to that. Haven't seen them since, I don't think I've seen them since his birthday in December. So uh, we need to do better about, um, about hanging out on days that are not somebody's birthday. But at any rate, I can't wait to see them and hang out tonight. So as I said, great interview today. I am speaking with author Tim Fasciola about his trilogy. Uh, The trilogy is called A Vengeful Realm. The books are The Breaker of Chains. That's the second one, sorry. The Scales of Balance, The Breaker of Chains, and The Age of the End. I'm going to give you a description of all three of those one at a time. So uh, when we go into the second second segment I will give you the in the description of the second book when we go into the third break I will give you the description of that third book um, after the third break during the third segment that makes more sense right so let me go ahead and get this set up the it's it's epic fantasy Um, so it is set in a time uh, he describes it as kind of gladiator meets Game of Thrones so you get that Game of Thrones feeling to it with the epic fantasy portion of things and then you also get uh as you can see by the cover next to me you get that gladiator feel um with the with with, you see the cover there and i am there we go scales of balance just trying to get everything set up (laughs) so let me go ahead and give you the description first of scales of balance that it is as follows Peace bought by blood seldom lasts, for vengeance knows no end. The same is true for mortals and gods alike. Decades, centuries, eras may pass, but the cycle remains. As war and revolution rise again, Zephyrus finds himself at the center of it all. Chosen by the gods, hailed as a prophet of liberation, and forged as a weapon to break the kingdom and restore balance to the realm, hope rests squarely on his shoulders. If only he could remember. Enslaved as a gladiator and thrust into a prince's game of espionage, Zephyrus has only two clues to help unlock his shattered past. A prophecy foretelling destruction and a letter to the enemy king promising peace. Now Zephyrus must survive the dangers of the gladiatorial arena, the cunning fury of the prince's enemies, and the god's torment if he is to find the truth of his identity and fulfill his fate. But to have any hope of breaking the cycle, first he must secure his freedom, and not just from his slavers. Within this vengeful realm, a queen protecting her kingdom, a prince defending his father, and a gladiator slave haunted by a prophecy, each contend for their own brand of freedom. But the gods have an agenda of their own, and they'll use any vessel, patrician, plebeian, or slave, to see it done. The scales must be balanced by peace or by blood. 
And so again, that is the description of the scales of balance. You see there, the author is Tim Fasciola, and I'm just going to turn this off. Epic Fantasy, all three books, uh, they're, they're not quite out yet, but the, the third book is coming out this month. So if you uh, are a fan of being able to read a series all at once, you can do that because you will uh, soon be able to have the complete series. Um, let's go ahead and turn to the interview with Tim so he can tell you more about A Vengeful Realm. Hi, Tim. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Really excited to be here. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to have you. We're going to talk epic fantasy today, which is always fun. But before we do that, um, let's talk about epic you. Uh, can you share a little bit about yourself so my listeners can get to know you? You know, when you sent the questions ahead of time, I was like, this is the hardest question. Oh, God, this is the hardest question. I, it is. And, so a little bit about me. Uh, fitness professional by day, uh, writer by night. Uh, I live out in the mountains with my wife. We love hiking and paddle boarding and being outside. And we're often the hosts when, uh, you know, people in the neighborhood, they come by. We have host board game nights and um, we love going to things like Renaissance fairs and um, playing Dungeons and Dragons. And we're all sorts of, you know, love that being outside, love the activity, but then love um, being nerds. <laughs> being at home <laughs> yeah absolutely um there's nothing wrong with both you can have a balance of outdoors and active and nerdy and not active um not that nerdy and inactive are necessarily <laughs> i did i just realized how that sounded i did not mean it to sound that way <laughs> i am a giant nerd myself so. <laughs> um and before we started recording you mentioned that it is 6 a.m for you so i i commend you um you look awake um I'm awake. Would, I'm showered. I'm I'm here. I'm pre present would, and accounted for. My eyes would be open, but I would mainly be grunting at this point. <laughs> <laughs> if I was six a.m., I don't speak in full sentences for a while, but <laughs> I'll do my best. I'll do my best. You're, you're doing good so far. So, um, epic fantasy. We have a trilogy, the uh, a vengeful realm. Um, let's start by giving just kind of an overview of the series of that trilogy. Sure. Um, well, be being it's, that it's video, I figured I may as well have some visual representation. Perfect. So um, first we have book one of A Vengeful Realm. So um, this is very much a like I one of the story seeds, like the seed that started this was con the concept was fantasy Spartacus. So okay. um, gladiator leads a rebellion, rebellion against you know, very overpowered empire. So that was the story seed. That was one. Um, the second seed was I wanted a mythology that in which the gods very much meddled and were tangible in mortal affairs. Um, and then it became, okay, after achieving freedom from the empire, then it's a matter of, well, there's bigger things going on. And now uh, the gods are getting involved. So this is book two. Um, you can see there's a little more magic going on with the ghosts. Uh, if you're if you get the pleasure of watching it with the 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 ghost character, and then um, book three we have here, uh, which is entitled "The Age of the End," which is very much um, a the gods have come to play, and it is not the mor the mortal realm is in uh, some danger. Um, and something that was really cool that uh, my cover artist put together was the oh, spines okay. make an image that kind of showcase like this transition yes. from uh, from things. Yeah. What what is, uh, you know, achieving freedom from mortals? That's one thing. But when you're trying to achieve it from um, a warring, maniacal God, it's it's uh, the stakes get a little higher. <laughs> yeah. Is that uh, Danella on the third book? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, the crown gave it away. Um, yeah. <laughs> as I was looking at it, I didn't remember what color her hair was, but I knew I recognized the crown. <laughs> um, and, the, and you mentioned you wanted kind of mythology. You wanted that sort of Spartacus gladiator feel. And it is, it's, it's, when I started reading it, I'm like, this is fantasy. I'm waiting for the magic. The magic doesn't quite come into play for a bit. Um, but it has this very Roman feeling. Some of the names and places even have that Roman mm -hmm. feeling. So did you kind of base some of that on Roman mythology uh, to a certain extent? 
Yeah. Yeah. The whole aesthetic, the whole culture. Um, I've always had like a fascination with like, um, Hellenistic culture and, and, you know, how the Greeks influenced Rome and, um, they're just like the, the te technologically, like the advancements they were able to make. I always found that fascinating and, um, politically and socially all of their, uh, tactics and how they maintained control over such a large landmass over, you know, such a, you know, long period of time. So one of the, the, founding concepts of this world was well what if the roman culture consisted into and dominated like the feudal period of mm -hmm. europe and and so like you know you've read so you can kind of see there's crossover there's like kings and castles yes and but yet there's this roman feel that's very much like um apparent and 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 there you know if you're at a crossroads of society of, of a society's development um you know there's some people who are kind of clinging to the old way and some people kind of pushing for the new and um when you have cultures that combine and you know the impacts of colonialism and you get to kind of see that and um the feuds and conflicts that arise from uh from that kind of thing it I, I wanted to explore all of that because I found it all interesting. So there was definitely very much um, like I wanted to use some language that was authentic, but also not so much that it's like, what is this? You know what I mean? Right. I didn't want it to be so um, obtuse or um, inaccessible for, for readers because epic fantasy can sometimes be. <laughs> it can be a lot um, if you haven't encountered it before. Um and see, I just completely lost my train of thought. I had a follow-up question and it blew right out of my brain um, because I was thinking about epic fantasy. Uh, this is, the trilogy is about, well, it depends on the version that you read probably, but uh, almost 2000 pages total. So um, um, yeah, let's see. Yeah, I'd say 18, 1800-ish, yeah. like give or take 18 to 1900. Yep. Um, so it's still a little tricky because all three books are out, which is awesome mm -hmm. for readers who are just discovering it because it's wonderful to find a series that you can read in its entirety. Um, that's the that's the one thing about epic fantasy. My my dad and my brother love 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 um, you know Wheel of Time and and Robert Jordan and like just uh, Game of Thrones, everything that's nine bajillion pages long. But they mm -hmm. they used to joke that they were going to get a bus, and they were just going to drive around the country and find epic fantasy writers and smack them. Because uh. <laughs> Finish your book. Finish your book. <laughs> that was very influential to me. Like uh, George R. R. Martin and Game of Thrones in particular was very influential to me. And I, I realized like, um, you know, I, I first actually watched the show before I read the books. So I watched season one was like, oh, this is my jam. I, <laughs> I am now sucked in. Um, I read all the books. And then, you know, I was like, this is great. Like, I'm ahead of the game now. I have, you know, all of this knowledge and I have all of this context. And then um, as the show kind of started to progress, I was like, we're running out of my aheadness. <laughs> I don't know where we're going from here. Yeah. Um, and now here we are 13 years later, still waiting for Winds of Winter. And that, that, um, sensation that feeling of like well is it happening isn't it happening like you can't have a conversation with uh fans of fantasy and have that not come up at some point yeah. um and you know the events of you know un the unfortunate passing of robert jordan and like if it weren't for brandon sanderson what would have happened to you know that e epic journey so yeah. i wanted to begin with the end in mind. That was something that was really important to me. Um, I wanted to write all three books, edit all three books, plant the little like Easter eggs and uh, the foreshadowing that like, okay, I have all the details. I have everything. And now I can like pick and choose my placements mm -hmm. um, to make it a more friendly reader experience. Um, creatively, it was a lot of fun. Uh, business wise, it's probably not the best idea. <laughs> this is why, you know, traditional publishers don't do this. Yeah. Um, but like at the same time, it really like I'm so abundantly proud of the story and the product because 
I had the end in my hand and I was like, you know what would actually be very helpful to kind of have a little detail here, let readers know subliminally, this is going to happen. This is the, you know, so that was uh, really fun. And I have, I have, uh, <laughs> I have George R. R. Martin and Patrick Rothfuss and Robert Jordan. I have all, like, I have a lot of people to thank for why I did this in the way that I did it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but back, back to the fact that it's complete and people could read it, it makes it a little more tricky to talk about them because we do not <laughs> want to give a lot away. We want, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's always the, the, the tricky. So um, the three books you showed them, Scales of Balance, The Breaker of Chains, The Age of the End. Um, let's just start with The Scales of Balance so people can get kind of, can you um, give a little overview of some of that story? Sure. Um, so it is a big cast. We have seven point of view characters. Uh, the big three uh, are... Zephyrus, Layden, and Danella. So um, this is after a 20 years of tentative peace, things are starting to break down. There are some theological disputes that are starting to cause division within the kingdom. Um, there are, you know, these prophecies that are starting to come about, and some people don't feel very pleased or safe about that. So they're trying to stifle um, and put down that. So at, at the rise of this oppression, um, there's going to be people who fight back. And Zephyrus is the an amnesiac, um, and he's he's prophesied to be this, you know, savior, even though the prophecy is somewhat um convoluted and 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 like equivocal. He's not really like what does this mean? Like he, right. he, and, he, he you know, be any part of that prophecy. That exactly. Yeah. And so he's like, is he was, you know, hoping this is going to clarify some things. It only raises more questions. Um, but then this is happening concurrently with a uh, Queen Danella is this isn't a spoiler. It happens on, you know, chapter one, page one. Um, you know, she loves her husband, the King, but uh, she's, preparing to assassinate him uh have him assassinated for his leniency to this um this religious group and um and these people who support it because she's afraid that it's going to incur the wrath of the gods and okay. she's you know doing this in secret like uh so her stepson prince laden who um has an interesting journey in and of like in and of himself, like he's kind of a microcosm of uh, this divided world as a whole. He's, you know, his father was, you know, royal, but his mother wasn't. Um, and that was a controversy in his youth. His father disappeared in a, you know, thought to be a, you know, died in the war and comes back all these years later. And, um, and then the moment he comes back, his father is part of the peace treaty that kind of ends this this civil war. Um, but in order to do so, his marriage is annulled and he's shipped off to marry Danella um, at, at the start of this kind of like new age. Um, so Layden is caught in this really weird position of like. I'm growing up with my dad, who I thought was dead. My mom, who's been my primary caretaker, is gone, and I never hear from again. And now I have like, I'm not, I'm not really a, a plebeian. I'm not really a patrician, and I have to kind of blend into this castle life where I do not belong. Um, so, Layden, having grown up now, um, realizes a little bit of what's happening because he's a little more plugged in. Um, into the other aspects of society than some of his, you know, com you know compatriots. What's the word I want? Like his contemporaries. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore he kind of sees the writing on the wall of like, okay, there's about to be, um, you know, an assassination attempt. There's about to be a coup. Um, and he doesn't realize that it's his stepmother that's propagating it, but he puts himself in the middle of it. And he is even using, Zephyrus to serve as a spy to stop uh, this this coup against the kingdom by just, you know, spy, get information, you give me information, I'll give you freedom. Um, and all all along, Danell is pulling the strings of, no, yeah. none of that's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. When I read you the description for Scales of Balance, it mainly talked about Zephyrus, which 
is great. He is one of the points of view, but now that you've heard an introduction from Tim and you know a little bit more about the book and the trilogy, you know that it is told from multiple points of view. And Tim was just talking a little bit about Layden and Daynella. And uh, for me, the beginning of book one, Layden was a little more, he was, there was a lot, there's a lot of gray areas, which is people, right? Um, but he, he made some choices that I wasn't quite sure how I was feeling about. Danella felt a little bit more straightforward. You know, you were supposed to kind of know she was instigating things. And um, it was harder to tell with Layden where he was going to come out. So that, that was well done in terms of, okay, well, we think he's, we, he, he just kind of rescued Zephyrus from one situation, but he's thrown him into a completely new situation that's complicated. And that's the great thing about characters when they, they really make you think and wonder, oh, oh my goodness, what is really going on here with this person? Um, it is time for our first break of the podcast. When we will come back, we'll be still talking about writing from multiple points of view. What were the challenges of that? What were the things that worked really well, etc. So stay tuned. You are listening and or watching the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Let's go. I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet. Damn, ain't that great. I don't wanna go to work, cause my boss is a jerk, and I'm not even that paid. I need a change in my life Cause I don't feel alive And there's nothing that makes me happy Oh, Hold my beer for a minute I'm about to quit my job Cash in for a ticket I'm going on a trip And I don't plan to visit I'm gonna stay there Till I feel like I'm winning Oh, And this is just the beginning I need a big change Help me feel like living I need a big swing Home runs I'm hitting And I'll never look back Moving on till I get it all And we all got dreams We all want things what you gonna do for it? How you gonna move for it? What you gonna be? And do you believe you can do anything? Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Tim was talking about uh, A Vengeful Realm, the trilogy, and some of the characters within that trilogy. Uh, we were talking a little bit about Layden and Daynella's roles within the trilogy. Um, we are going to continue, of course, with talking about this trilogy. As we get started, I just want to remind you once again that if you are wanting to support the podcast and the network in a specific way, you can do so by going to gsmcpodcast.info and leaving a tip or a donation again just if you are willing to support the show in that way, that's wonderful. I thank you. Um, but gsmcpodcast.info for the for uh, for leaving tips and or donations. Greatly appreciate all the support that you give. As we now continue in this, I'm going to move on to the second book of the series. This one is called The Breaker of Chains, and you can see the cover there and The Breaker of Chains. So let me go ahead and give you the description of this book. This is the second book in the trilogy, and that description is as follows. Nurania has woken from peace's slumber to a nightmare. Denied the nightly rains, crops fail, people divide, and revolution blooms between every crack in the kingdom's failing foundation. King Varos, supposedly dead, Laden, the traitor, is a fugitive, and the, the uprising's patience has ended. Following Zephyrus's up, open defiance of the crown, war has come, and no one will emerge unscathed. While Danella dis directs Damascus to finish the war her father started, Laden frees gladiator slaves to raise an army against them. With New Rainia burning, Vicanalia, a prisoner of the uprising, attempts to prove herself more valuable than a king's ransom. And Ilya, after skirting death to become a servant in the divine realm, learns of a treacherous plot amongst the gods with Zephyrus at the center of it all. Now with the aid of Ilya in the divine realm and Laden in the mortal, Zephyrus must claim the lost relics of long-dead gods if he has any chance of facing the traitor god and breaking the chains that bind all of humanity. But plans are in place. The age of the end is coming. And that is the description of the age of the end. As you can see from that, we are getting a lot more. Um, you can see a lot of those character names are now present in that description. So you are seeing um, the 
you're seeing those different points of views and points of view and how they are being represented within the trilogy. So you're getting a lot of different experiences through those different points of view. But let's go ahead now and move to the second segment of this interview with Tim. Were there any particular challenges in writing from that many points of view? And what made you decide to actually approach it from from all of those points of view? Sure. Um, so yeah, there's seven. That's definitely challenging. Um, if you look at any like writing structure, advice, plotting, yada, 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 it's like, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> um, it's, it, it's very much like everything. It's not don't do that, but everything is designed off of like, you know, one or two, sometimes mm -hmm. three, like a lot of um, very rarely you'll see seven. Uh, uh, luckily, I had a great editor who helped me navigate some of those challenges. Um, but I'll answer why I did it first and then more of like how I navigated it. So mm -hmm. in terms of the why, I think it's really hard to get a good view of a world if you're only seeing it from one or two people's eyes. Um, I wanted to show representation from different belief systems, different backgrounds, different geographic areas, um, different sides of this war and different side, like at different points in time. And like this, having people with so many different viewpoints, I think is more um, representative of what our world is mm -hmm. um, that we don't live in a homogenous society where everyone comes from the same belief system and everyone has this same worldview and same value system. Um, so if you only are seeing the world from one or two points of view, there's just a lot of missed opportunities to really explore the world. So I had like, like as an early writer, I was like, well, I need to show this whole world that I've built. And my first draft of Eventual Realm of, of the Scales of Balance was 280,000 words. Mm -hmm. My editor was like, this is great. Because like I was coming off reading, you know, I was coming off reading Game of Thrones and, um, you know, the Stormlight Archives. I'm like, there are a thousand page books. I, I'm fine. This is 950. <laughs> yeah. It's no big deal. Uh, she was like, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> it's really um, hard to read in the tub with, with a thousand page books. You know, it, it, you got to think of the people where they're reading. It's really hard to read anywhere. With it's, <laughs> yes, it's It becomes it a weapon. It's yes. like, you know, when you get on a plane, they're like, please stow that, sir. That is, <laughs> yeah. um, it is, it, it, so I, had all of this information i thought i needed to include it um and like she really like literally cut it in half um but like wanted to keep that same fullness um and the way in which i i i think i managed to do so was um focusing on character arcs and letting the world come out organically through those so uh very often when you have so many characters uh there is a de-evolution of how the, their development they like they they just kind of stalls or you have to focus the page space on one versus another and so if i if i used a lot of the same tools that are like you know seven point plot method and um the concept of like snowflake method to okay here's here's the here's the seed um and here's how i you know, develop this arc. Once I've completed a character arc, like I have spreadsheets of like, um, okay, here's one character's, you know, the, their seven point plot. Here's their seven point plot, seven point plot, seven point. And when you have seven, seven times seven, 49. So theoretically, automatically, I'm going to have 49 chapters, right? <laughs> um, and then then it was a matter of like, okay, how does this fit in like timeline wise, chronologically, when do I want to tell this versus chronologically, when does it actually happen? Um, and then the other component of that was like, okay, this, this gives us the big moments, but like the interconnections and, and how these things like, because at, at first, especially in book one, these characters are, um, you can start to see, um, like, okay, I can see how these guys might be connected. And you think like, okay, this person's connected to that person. This person's connected to that person. But eventually it all comes together. And it's um, you kind of can't tell um, one of their stories without all of the others. And that that type of interconnectivity um, I've always found fascinating um, in media that I've like engaged with. So um, it was important to me to create create a world that felt lived in by different people. 
mm-hmm. and not just like one um one or two in epic fantasy i feel like you usually do get quite a few different perspectives yeah. um and so that it just felt very natural for me i'd say the biggest challenges is like i had to spend a lot of time with each character to figure out like who are you what do you actually want what is important to you what factors into your decision making process and um like once again i had a great editor who was like you need to study some psychology you need to understand like what what how people's moral development begins and grows um and that like really paved the way for you know there's one thing to have a character's goal a character's motivation but a character's moral reasoning what factors into their motivations um it just really was a big um very big eye opener and um like a game changer in a lot of ways also from not just drafting but even editing like ah this character's not ready for this moment yet this can't happen here so Mm -hmm. like there's just so many um opportunities i'd say that was probably the biggest challenge like having to increase my understanding of the human of the human condition um but i think it translates to a story that showcases that in in some respects so um it was very fun to write (laughs) (laughs) i can only imagine though the amount of uh let's just call it the bible that would be behind everything that you have you have characters, you have storylines, you have belief systems because there's multiple belief systems with different gods and different understandings. And they're of course not agreeing. Um, that's, that's actually what I was going to say earlier when you're talking about kind of the, the Roman era, the, the feudal era, the fun thing about fantasy is you can, you're, you're making your own world. So you can combine those things. So for you, how was that world building process? Did you start with characters? Did you start with countries did you start with belief systems how did that work for you sure um so first i um i would i would do it differently i do do it differently now than when i first started out when i first started out um i started with um the mythology and like the creation of the world um what is the mythos surrounding like the genesis you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like how how did this come to be um and how does that impact the world and then the trickle down from there so um there are areas within the story um within this like this world in particular that like hmm, would that have been how that would have happened like the concept of um like historically there's there's enough possibility to be like yeah that that could have happened but um now i kind of i kind of start with geography like i i begin with the geography what does this world look like and it it starts with like many phases um starts with geography then it, i kind of go into magic systems because once you have magic in a world it changes everything mm-hmm. it like how like everything from resource availability and scarcity like depending on what the magic can do um it like that's going to if there's magic it's going to influence the politics it's going to likely connect to religion and theology it's going to likely influence how um you know countries engage with one another and um and lines like whether it be political or um geographic or diplomatic where these lines are going to start to form um and that like i (laughs) a massive spreadsheet that like i've created a template for myself um that like everything from culture and society um you know like very often the our culture and society are framed by our belief systems and by, like they kind of reinforce one another like one hand washes the other once you get going so then it's like okay i've started this and this started bringing me here and now i developed this but that brings me back to where i started and i want to make sure that this like is, is this still um like bringing to get like is, are they bringing together or are they starting to divide um and co- just cohesiveness having cohesion and um inter interplay interconnectivity between these um different uh different subsystems is really fascinating but like 
magic was something that you can probably feel it. Like you said uh, in the early reading, there's like, there's not a lot of magic on page and it isn't until really the end of book one that you start to see it. And then spoiler alert, book two just kind of <laughs> comes out the gate with magic. So it's like, uh, there's much, much more of it. Um, and, and for the rest of the series, but, um, the, the magic system, I was like, yeah, I don't really know why it works yet. I don't know how it works yet. And then once I started to like figure that out and connect it into the, you know, the rest of the themes of the story, um, both like in its mechanics and how it works, but also like, once again, thematic, thematic wise, it like it, I wanted there to be, I wanted the catharsis that I wanted to get for the reader by the end of the series, I wanted that to be so interwoven throughout. Um, so that, yeah, world building is super, super fun for me. Uh, I really enjoy it. Uh, I know some people hate it. I know some people it's like daunting or it's like, it's so easy to get lost in the weeds. Like I want to get lost in the weeds. Cause if I get lost, that means this world can feel lived in. Um, I don't want to like, I don't want to just dabble in the world. I want to be part of it, you know? Yeah. The maps in the books, did you draw those? Did you have someone help you draw those? I mean, how do you create an entire new place and places? So there's a couple resources available online um, that like, um, and once again, the map for this trilogy was not done this way. This was me just drawing and going like, I think I know enough about geography and I do not. Uh, so like, um, like the mountain formation, I don't like, these are the, like the little things. It's like, yeah, that probably isn't as real as it could have been. Mountains don't make L's, you know, like, <laughs> but like for the most, if it, if it ruins your, uh, if it, you can't suspend your disbelief and it, it takes you out of the story that the mountains are like not as authentic as our mountains. I'm, I'm sorry <laughs> if that, I hope that doesn't ruin your reading experience, but I admit it is there. Um, but like, I want, I wanted something that like showed this opportunity for connectivity, but also like reasonable divisions could arise from. Um, and because like the Rainian people are migrants that, come and settle um Perillion Stockholm like this whole landmass of um these large islands so to speak so um I I wanted this like I wanted a very clear differences of like okay we're we're here versus we are there I wanted that sense of place to be much more um like you can feel a difference when you're in each place. Um, but at the same point in time, it's probably not geographically sound. Like ge mm -hmm. a, a geologist would be like, that's not how that works. <laughs> <laughs> a cartographer would be like, that's not how that works. Um, but I, I, I had this drawn out like, pen and paper and then i i gave it to an artist was like can you make this not look like this <laughs> um and she did i i love the map i love how it came out um the the color one is gorgeous it's just a uh i i i love the world now i use like actual map making software that like if i put land here and mountain there it's going to it's on its own going to algorithmically form rivers based on what is the water, what is the wind, what is the, okay. and then I go, okay, now I have a geographically sound world. And now, and that's why I start with it. Because if I come in with, with this story, I came in with like, well, this has to be here and that has to be there and that's there. And it's like, well, that wouldn't actually probably work. <laughs> um, but I have gods that start earthquakes when they're upset. So it like, mm, I can do what I want. <laughs> It's you not tectonic that. plates. It's not like it's I can gods. do what I want. Uh, it's God. So it's, I, I think I, uh, I can give myself a little a bit of a pass with that, but uh, yeah. So that's, that's, I, I drew it out. I hired someone to make it prettier than I had any, any chance of making it. So um, when in doubt, hire out when you can. So <laughs> I'm um, just, I keep picturing that, that I don't know if it was Facebook, TikTok, but I've seen it multiple places where uh, you just take rice, dump it on a paper and draw around it. <laughs> Have you seen that? In, how oh, yeah, absolutely. 
<laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it works in theory. Theoretically, it works. <laughs> in actuality, it probably Absolutely. isn't going to give you the most um, – I mean, it, it's like a common trope within fantasy, and I think I think it's video games that I view. I like I blame video games for this in fantasy worlds. But like, when you are playing a video game, you want as you're exploring the world things to look different. You want the tiles and the aesthetic to change. If it's mm -hmm. always like, if you're always in the woods and it always feels like you're in the woods, it's not that dynamic. But like, if you're going from like mountains and woods to deserts and oceans and and um beaches and volcanoes and then there's an ice valley it's like this it's a much more visually nice. engaging and it's the, the amount of space between is like in right. reality right in right. reality to create these climate differences these zones um yeah well it's not that exploring to watch people walk <laughs> it's I was not gonna that say, fantasy books were typically walking a lot there's so. especially like the quest archetypes it's like uh, yeah with your one loaf of bread <laughs> and that chunk of cheese that you grabbed before you had to leave your house in the middle of the night because something weird was attacking <laughs> and the dried meats come on <laughs> no one wants to eat that much dried meat so it's like i i as much as i understand why it's a thing and i understand like the perfectionist in my brain is like Ugh, how do i do this and it's like you have to find the balance you have to you have to accept that like what is better for the story right. um even though it's not a hundred percent authentic uh you have to you have to let some things go and like i i think i think for the sake of the story it works very well <laughs> Uh, you know, there are those of us who are like, yes, but where are people going to the bathroom? I mean, you can't include everything. I mean, uh, I do you want to read that? <laughs> want probably to read that? not, but it would make me laugh. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, sometimes I do wonder about those sorts of things. Where, when are they going to the bathroom? Where are they going to the bathroom? Uh, you, you know, there's a lot of things that happen in our day-to-day -day lives. And I know it, it would, that would be uh, very silly to include all of those details like every detail would get annoying but um you know the occasional reference about the logistics of things which was not the actual conversation that we were just having in terms of what you include how you include it what needs to be left out what needs to be left to the imagination etc you know and even just from world building how do you include everything or not everything and and have it still make sense uh, it's time for our second break of this episode when we come back we will be talking um about names in fantasy which are sometimes hard to pronounce if you heard me stumbling a little bit reading the description of the breaker of chains it's 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 interesting and it's always interesting how we the readers hear you know pronounce names and how the author actually intends for them to be pronounced so we are going to uh, have that conversation when we come back uh, stay tuned you're listening and watching the gsmc book review podcast and i will be right back with more uh interview with author tim fasciola For the best and latest podcasts available anywhere, go to the podcast app on your cell phone and type in GSMC to access free content-rich podcasts on health and wellness, book reviews, sports, entertainment, relationships, social media, movies, technology, finance, and even weird news. Subscribe and download the GSMC Podcast Network's family of shows, available everywhere podcasts are found. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Tim Fasciola. Before the break, we were talking about plot and world building and details and what you leave out and what you include and how you go about making those decisions, how much can be implied, etc. Uh, we have one more book in this trilogy for me to give you the description of. So let me go ahead and set that up so that you can see the image. This one is called The Age of the End. It is not out yet, but it will be out very, very soon. So like I said, if you want to read all three at once, you can do that. This is the description of The age of the end. The flood of blood drowns Nurania, but the age of the end is only just beginning. Though the traitor god within Valencia has been exposed, and Zephyrus and Threna 
wild the artifacts of long, de long dead deities, the way to the divine realm is blocked. The Harbinger has ascended to slaughter the gods and leave the mortal realm in ruins. Yet Zephyrus, Laden, Vicanalia, Ilya, and Threna have even more pressing concerns. The Skeleton King has come to New Rania's shores. Empowered by cursed magic, he and his legions will stop at nothing to consume every soul in the mortal realm in service to their one true god. Regardless if they're Valencian or Celestic, Rainians or Helms, free or enslaved peoples, everyone must join together if they hope to outlast the apocalypse. Even the worst of enemies. Bonds of friendship and love will be tested. Chains of guilt and disdain will come undone. One way or another, the scales will be set right and nothing will ever be the same again. And so you're getting, you, you can see, there's, there's a lot going behind these, but you can see the progression as we read just the descriptions of these uh, three books. And so hopefully you are intrigued, especially if you are a fan of high fantasy and you're saying, you know what? Yes, I, I do want to know more about these books. So let's return now to the interview with Tim. And we'll be talking about, as I said, names in fantasy. So um, somebody commented to me recently about uh, names in fantasy books and how sometimes they can be a little challenging. And I'm, I'm laughing to myself because uh, I thought I was doing pretty good with yours, but um, you're saying Zephyrus in my head. I said Zephyrus. Uh, you're saying Danella in my head. It was Danella. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how much I have trouble naming my pets. How do you go about naming this many characters and figuring out fantasy names? So. I hate naming things. <laughs> Me too. Hate naming things. Thing one, thing two. I would love, like, it, I, when I was in a band and, like, I'd write the songs and, like, bandmates would be like, okay, what's the name of this song? And I'd be like, I got nothing. That's on you. I have given you everything else. You need to, you need to meet me halfway here. Like, could not name songs. Um, so, character names, um, different some characters like it's just like yeah this feels right or like i like that i like the sound this has i like the meaning behind this and others it was it's more like um like this this represents something some like construct in my head you know and it's usually arbitrary at the, when it gets to that point um so yes uh in terms of the pronunciations yeah like i I told you, like, I, my, my best TikToks that I've recorded are the ones where it's like pronouncing fantasy <laughs> names, and it's like, uh, it's, 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 I, no matter how much you try to make your name simple, unless you're doing like Matt and Rand, you're still gonna, <laughs> but then as much as you have some easy, like, some gimmies like that, then you have things like the Aes Sedai, and it's like, the, the, why, why is there an apostrophe here? Like, where, how does this change the? And there's so many like names. It's like I, I don't know how to run, I don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> um, so I feel like um, my big thing is naming conventions. I wanted okay, if you are from this this culture, like these are the naming conventions around this culture. Um, if you're from so like a lot of the Iranians and the Valencians, like there's a, a lot of male names either end in like U S or they end in like an N it's like that very, very common. That's like the, the naming structure. Um, whereas um, the, a lot of the Celestic people, the people of Stockholm, um, their names don't really have that same, those same hard rules, but they're usually shorter. They're less syllables um, or like they have stronger consonants in a lot of their names. Like, so it was just like, I wanted, I wanted the naming conventions to be consistent across, like across the different things. But then when you have two worlds that come together and, you know, this forced assimilation, well, now you're starting to get things that start to amalgamate and change a bit. And I wanted that, I didn't want it to be so obvious that like, okay, once again, it doesn't, it's not going to feel all that lived in. So, um, like the hard and fast lines of like, okay, this is in this box, this is in this box. But when you actually put them all on the, on the board, so to speak, they start to mix together and things change. Yeah. Um, so I wanted those influences, but like, um, so coming up like Zephyrus's name. So um, when, <laughs> when recording the audio book, um, I needed to put together a pronunciation guide for the narrator. Um, 
So, and then like we're meet, he has the sheet in front of him. He's looking at, it, he's like, yeah, I just still don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> I was like, I have it. Like, I don't know how to write phonetically. And then, um, he's like, I, is it this? I'm like, no, that's not it at all. <laughs> so it's like, I'm glad because I almost put that in the book. Like that would have been more confusing if I have a pronunciation guide, people can't follow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, like I've, I've heard. Zephyrus, I've heard Zephyrus, I've heard uh Zephyrus, I've heard like all sorts of things. And I've I've never been like most people are they're gonna read the first letter, associate that word yeah. shape, and then that's the character and like yeah. how you I have to talk to someone about it. Like I and um I imagine being on a podcast, right? It's like okay. I know how to spell the names of your characters. I don't know how to say them. Yeah. like I think I, I always find that um very funny. And people who listen to the audio, they can't spell anything. So it's right. yep. <laughs> it's like they're typing. I'm like, I have no idea who you're talking about. And I wrote the book, you know. <laughs> so it's it's always it's always fun. Um but yeah, I think um a lot of the names, like now that I'm working on like um a Ghosts of Rainia, which is uh, Thrana's origin story. So she's a character um, throughout the trilogy. Like um, that, like I just finished that up. That's being edited Thrania now. Thrania pronounced right, just in case. So you know. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> I got one. <laughs> there we go. Um, but like, so now I'm like world building again for like this. I've been in this world for like 10 years now. So like getting to like start from scratch and you know, change how I do things and kind of once again, begin with the end in mind a little better, having learned a thing or two from going through this once. Um, I'm like coming up with names again, going like, oh, I don't miss this. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. It's hard. I it, find yeah. it very, very challenging to name things because um, you want to evoke a feel. Um, you want to evoke some degree of consistency. Um, so like using using root, root, words using um other languages to kind of influence um how sounds i wouldn't say i used a lot of other languages i used a lot of latin um mm -hmm. to kind of help uh in the naming conventions of some things um but for the most part it's like does this sound cool and does this fit this naming convention does this roll off the tongue um and it may have rolled off my tongue. Like I grew up, <laughs> so um, I grew up with a speech impediment. I couldn't say my L's and R's. So the name, like six year old me, would have hated this it's, book. Yes. All like Daynella, Daynawa. Yeah. I would have, mm, Zephyrus, Zephyrus. Like yeah. I would have weighed in. I'm like, why did I do this? Like <laughs> little me is very upset. New Rainia, it would be New Rainia. Like it would, it, uh, it would have been awful. <laughs> Ilya, I can't, so, Ilya, Ilya, I can't even, Ilya, Ilya, Ilya. Ilya. <laughs> it would, gross, that sounds gross, that doesn't sound like a good name, that doesn't sound like it fits any name, Ilya, um, <laughs> Ilya, <laughs> well, I, I've been reading Terry Brooks since high school, or junior high, uh, I don't even know, and to me, it was all, to me, and my, my dad, who introduced me to the series, it's always Shannara, so mm -hmm. we always said it, and then I get the, I start listening to the audiobooks, and it's Shannara, and it, I wanted to, I, nope, obviously, it's, not I didn't name it, so I can't say how it's pronounced. But I hated the narrator for pronouncing it. Shannara. I attended a. Um, he was the keynote speaker. I don't remember what conference it was, um, but like, I remember that was the first time I heard Shannara, and I was just like, <laughs> "How is this guy?" I like I so brazen. I was like, "He said the he said his own name wrong." Like I was so convinced that he was wrong. He was wrong. So, and then I had to like take inventory for a bit and go, Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. But, um, so you actually answered part of my question because this trilogy is complete, but I was going to ask if you're returning to the world and you are. So is, um, Therania's story, what you're working on now? Um, so yeah, I'd say that, that is like it's in the editing process at this point. Um, so I'm hoping it's a little longer than I wanted it to be. Um, so I'm I'm trying to condense some things and trim some things to just uh sharpen sharpen it to more of a razor's edge as opposed to this 
feels a little bit more like a mace. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, so editing that now. So it's uh, Threna's first encounter with um, with the Skeleton King um, in old Rainia before, um, before the, the Great Migration. Um, and that is a very dark story. Um, there, there's imagine. like I, something like I always wanted with these books. I wanted like um, – there's hope at the end. There's all like, that's what we are. There's hope at the end. Um, it's going to be dark, but we're going to push through. And if, if the sun hasn't come out yet, we haven't reached the end yet. And that's kind of like um, philosophically, like it just kind of what I, th what I value, what I think is important. Um, and I, I like, I love a lot of like, I love so much of the journey. Like I'm reading like grim dark and then it gets to the end and I'm like, this doesn't feel like the end. Cause it's so dark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so like I wanted there to be like, it reads like a grim dark, but then it kind of has this uplift um, at the end that, you know, restores a degree of hope for humanity. Um, but writing within this world, um, like Ghost of Rainia still has that hope, but it's definitely, I'd say, a darker tone than um, this trilogy. Um, but the the other stories in this world are a possibility. Um, there are there's another sister trilogy that has been in my head for a number of years that would it like elements of it found its way into the series um, in like books two and three. Um, so I won't say too much on that, but there's like a character that has overlap, even though it's a 300 year gap, the conflict of the gods is very much showcased, um, at this other point in history See, in this other place. About. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so one so character like, I can think who would have a 300 year overlap. <laughs> mm -hmm. So like, that's really fun. I, one day I would definitely love to explore that story. Um, then there's i so i don't do have you read like the red rising series and I'm not but I've, okay I, I know so them. there's the original trilogy and then it has a very definitive end and it could have ended there and some people wish it did end there but the author brought it back and then there's a quartet that's like that follows up like 10 years later um and i've I'm so curious how the the seventh book hasn't come out yet. So I'm really curious to see how it wraps up. And my whole thing is I will only open up this trilogy again. Like if I, I'm totally fine to write like short stories and like things from the world and things that happened before or things that happened, um, you know, during and give other context. But in terms of adding past the ending that I have, I'm very hesitant to do so because I love the ending personally. Mm -hmm. I don't, uh, we'll see if book three comes out in a couple of weeks. We'll see how people feel about it. Um, but like, I love this ending. It feels very, it felt very right to me. Um, it gave me the catharsis I wanted when writing it. Um, I hope it gives the readers that same, the, those same feelings. But um, in order to open up this story again, I did leave seeds. Yes. I did leave little places where I can like, ah, this is going to be trouble <laughs> um, to reopen it. But yes. I do think there's a degree of if I open it too soon, it kind of cheapens the journey of this mm -hmm. original trilogy. Um, if I open it too late, it's kind of like, well, what's the point with the characters that we've grown to know and love aren't there? Um, and there's also an element of I think um, there's a lot of influence from like things like the marvel comic universe like the movies like that first 23 arc movie series like it did so well and then now there's like this second era it's not doing as well and it's like sometimes it's just better to leave that and let's move on let's do a new thing and um but I, like I, I do love these world. I love this character, these characters. Um, I gave myself the opportunity, but it's definitely something that like I would plot out from beginning to end, know the ending. I might not mm -hmm. do the same thing and write right. all of the books, um, but I would absolutely have the whole thing plotted out and know, okay, this ending is even better than that ending. So I will do it, but that's what it would take for me to go back and um, reopen it to continue the story. Yeah. Yeah. Cause 
fans are complicated. <laughs> Nobody, yeah. You can't you can't make everybody. You happy can't please because, everyone. No, exactly. Somebody's going to be angry with you for no matter any what number of things, from pronunciation to endings to everything in between. Well, I think there's a degree of subjectivity and objectivity um, within like story structure. Like objectively, there's an end. Like there's a subliminal message throughout. Like there's a subliminal promise that's being fulfilled. Um, and it's it's my job to communicate that effectively. You know, that's my job as the author. And um, it's not going to resonate with everyone. But my goal as an author is to make my intended goal my intended vision for the story, I want the most people possible to be able to resonate with that vision. If I have done that, I've done my job. That's how I view it. Like some, I know some creators, it's like, um, well, it's up to the reader to decide how it ends. And for some people, like some people love that because it's a great conversation starter. I don't. I feel like I'm doing the work for you. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just give me an ending. Yeah. Um, but that it, like some things go on too long and you wish they ended and some things get cut short before and some things just kind of fizzle out. So it's like, where, where do you draw that line? Um, and the current line of where it's drawn, I'm very pleased with. So what and more can I do? You said a couple of weeks for the third one. What's the release date? Um, so this is where things get – this should be a very easy cut and dry <laughs> question with a very easy cut and dry answer. Um, I believe the Kindle ebook and the hardbacks and paperbacks will be available on the 24th, April 24th. Okay. Um, the audio book – will likely oh, yeah. be released a little yeah. earlier. Oh, earlier. Um oh, yes, that's it is finished. Later. Um it might be like the 17th. It's w Audible um I released through Audible. I can set like come out on this day, but then like um I like in terms of giving out arcs, it's like I I can go through NetGalley, I can go through the, the, the. it's just like okay, I have I have the promo codes. I want I want to get them out. I want to get people listening to it and then that way I feel like people who do audiobooks like they're going to turn this out really quickly and then boom on launch on launch day um where I'm like telling everyone, "Hey, it's launch." <laughs> um there's already some degree of like there's some reviews out already and all that sort of stuff. So um I would say the 24th is the, <laughs> the let's go with the 24th somewhere towards the middle to the end of april good to know the 24th the 17th i mean you can get the audiobook on the 17th and uh, we know i love an audiobook so that is great uh but it's coming out somewhere around in the next couple of weeks right i mean you'll find it it's good. And then you'll have the whole thing. <laughs> We're going to take our final break of this episode. When we come back, Tim will be talking about that path for publication, how it worked for him, why he decided to publish, etc. Stay tuned. You are listening to and watching the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. <laughs>
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Tim Fasciola. Before the break, we were talking about the release date. Maybe it's the 17th, maybe it's the 24th. Just depends on it just depends on what format you want to consume this book in. But you will figure it out because my my listeners, my readers, you're all very, very, very smart. So I have no doubt that you are going to figure this out. No problem. Let's go ahead and get to that last segment of this interview. If I can find the right area, bear or just give me a second. I was doing so well right up till this point. What made you decide that you wanted to write for publication and why epic fantasy specifically? Okay. Um, originally the plan was never to publish. This was a story written for me. Um, it was a creative outlet when I was working a lot um, in fitness and like having crazy dreams because like, I just wasn't exercising, you know, the creative aspects of my personality and because of that it was um oozing out of my brain and <laughs> my sleep um but it was so it was really just i was writing for me um i got to the point where i finished it and was kind of like a what do i do now like i had finished book one and was like what do i do now um and then I found I found my editor on Readsy and then that became like well here's what you can do to like you know further your career and I was like career <laughs> i was like that it kind of it, it sounds stupid but it was like that kind of hit me i was like oh oh like, mm, uh, I, I i guess like i guess that's what people do when they write a book they publish it um and i i went through like i did the querying trenches um i started querying in 2020 which publishing in 2020 was it was mm-hmm. it was a time it was yeah. what a time to be alive <laughs> um but it, I hated it. <laughs> um, I, I it, it's, I, I like systems. I like efficiency. I like a lot, so many agents that I have had the pleasure of, you know, speaking to, um, they are the kindest, most passionate people on earth. Um, editors, like they love story. They love engaging with authors. Um, but it's the business side of it is like, it is churn and burn to such a degree that like a lot of it's hard to create relationships. And I think that's really the whole point is the connectivity through like, it's just this books are a medium of connectivity. Um, So that concept, like treating the book as a business was like, okay, so I've written book one, I need to publish book one, but then I have to, I'm on a deadline now for book two. But I also mm-hmm. have my full time job, and I have this deadline. And what if I can't? I'm like now I understand why George R. R. Martin couldn't, pay, or you know, like I understand mm-hmm. why. Um, right. Not that he's ever met a deadline since, <laughs> <laughs> like, but so. I wouldn't. That would not have worked for me if I have a deadline. I'm like, okay, I need to get this done. Um, I get an email. I'm like, I need to respond to this now. Like, it's a problem. <laughs> um, so it there's a degree of um, the business is you. If book one sells, great. Then we'll ask for a book two. You know, you can sell. Like, um, I did have in December twenty twenty. Um, I had pitched at an event, and uh, a small press had reached out, and they were like, uh, you know, submit an application, and we think we'd be really interested in your story, yada yada. Um, and that was like a three month courting period. Um, they got back to me. They were like, we would love to publish your book, and I it was kind of hit with this. Like, I remember I had like being on the phone call. And the woman telling this to me and she's like, are you sitting down? And I was just like, no. <laughs> um, and like, I, I, but she, she told me like, you know, we're going to, we, we'd love to publish your book. And I think she was expecting this like, yeah, kind of reaction. Right. And I, and I just felt like, <laughs> do I want this? Do I want this? Mm-hmm. And, and um, after some deliberation, after talking with people, after, you know, really sitting with it, I realized, no, I don't. Um, Cause like if from a business standpoint, it's like, okay, you can't sell book two until you've sold book one. So just keep writing book ones until something hits. And then now that you, now that that's hit, expand upon that. Um, but like, this was the story I wanted to tell. 
this was the story that I was writing for me. So mm -hmm. to only write a third of it and be like, well, hopefully other people are interested in it. Um, that didn't work for my create the cre the business side of it. That makes perfect sense. But the creative side of it was like, I don't, that doesn't feel good in, in me. I don't, that doesn't jive with, um, the space I want to create from. So, um, I understand why people do it. It just, it wasn't for me. So that's why I decided to, um, like finish it and rapid release. Um, so that was when I decided to, um, publish it. I'm sorry. I forgot part B of that question. <laughs> I think you, I think you kind of answered it. Uh, why epic fantasy? Well, you wrote it for you. Well, uh, clearly. Yeah. This is, <laughs> um, yeah, I think you enjoy it, it's definitely, I've, and it's always been, it's, I've always really enjoyed. Um, I think I'll all like, I've, tr I've tried to write not epic and just have like small cast. <laughs> the concept of a short story stresses me out, <laughs> stresses me. Out. I need a long <laughs> runway. Um, and I think that's just, um, you know, I've, I've talked to my editor. I've talked to other authors about it. And they're like, oh, that's just your brand. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. But I feel like I should be able to, you know, exercise these uh, other muscles. And, um, but there's, there's a degree of, um, there are smaller, more condensed stories that I love. But generally speaking, the bigger something is, the more interconnected something is, the more I can fanboy over it. And that's mm -hmm. really what I'm after. <laughs> um, and that I think the epic fantasy lends itself well. Um, I'd also do like I would I would do epic sci-fi, but it would also be epic. You know, I would do like a space opera. Space I would not opera. I wouldn't just do like it has some sci-fi elements. Like I don't think I could do that. Right. Well but then nothing you also against have... that. It's just and you also um, have to do a lot of research into science because you have to you have to know stuff <laughs> magic uh, yes. is magic you can fudge a little bit science you gotta at least Sci not be plausible hard science you gotta you have to do some research you yeah. can do there's some soft science out there for sure but like um you know the midichlorians and, <laughs> um but like there's <laughs> there's definitely um a degree of you have to have some systems in place to make it believable and functional and um, have people in your story as opposed to thinking of like trying to break it. Like there's always going to be those people who are like, this doesn't work. Yep. Um, but yep. um, for people who want to know more about you, about the books um, website, if you have one and any social media you're active on. Yes. Uh, so website is Tim Fasciola. So T I M F A C C I O L A. Uh, dot com. Um, that is the website for all, all things bookish. Um, I am on social media. Uh, I'd say I'm most active on TikTok. Um, if you search the handle at Tim Fasciola, that'll show up, but I'm also known as at Epic Fantasy Author, which that probably should make sense. <laughs> um, and then, um, on Instagram, I'm, it's Tim Fasciola underscore the author. Um, because I also have my fitness stuff. So there's, there's, I don't really post for that anymore, but I am, I am very findable on the internet. Okay. <laughs> in different capacities for better or worse. Um, but I would say, uh, in terms of getting in touch, um, you can go through the contact via my website or, um, through, um, uh, I'm try to respond to, everyone i'm on uh, everyone on tiktok so um because that's once again i said it earlier like what's it about it's connection yeah. and if people connect with my stories like that's awesome i i i i love that and i hope it uh that continues to be the case and absolutely tim is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to make sure you highlighted during this time um I think from a, if, if, if you're giving me a soapbox, the soapbox I'd stand on is um, I think most people have a story on their heart that they want to tell and just don't know how. Um, and there are so many tools and resources out there, right? Like there's free things, there's courses, there's um, like so many like webinars and there's so much you can learn. Um, you, explore, try things, find your thing. Um, 
But if you have a story, the only way it's going to get told is by investing the time in it. It's it, I don't believe in good ideas and bad ideas. I think there's nurtured ideas and neglected ideas. So if you have an idea, feed it, water it, nurture it. Um, and even if it's just for you, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, I'm going to write a book and put out a book a year. It might just be I have this one story I want to tell and I'm going to spend 30 years putting it together. Like it, whatever it is, um, if you have a story to tell, the world is waiting. Um, so I just, I encourage, I think we were created to be creative and, um, take every opportunity to invest in that and flex that muscle. Thank you. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me this morning. I know it's early, but, um, I really appreciate you talking about the, the trilogy and other writings. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. It's, a, it's always a pleasure to get to talk about something that you've worked so hard on and created. Absolutely. So I appreciate you having me here. Thank you so much. Thank you once again to Tim for joining me to talk about all three books of the A Vengeful Realm series. I really appreciate it. Uh, like I said, third one's almost out. So if you want to read the whole thing at once, definitely check it out. I, I love fantasy. Um, there's an epic fantasy, you know, you you get a lot you get you get the epicness of it so if you love epic fantasy some people love it some people hate it it can be it can be a lot you know but this one is three books they're all out <laughs> you can read the whole thing you do not have to wait for 20 years to conclude this series there might be other books in the world that's cool but this wraps up you actually get a conclusion there's some things that you think eh? could maybe I could okay there's some stuff that could be worked on there but you do get a conclusion so if you are a fan of epic fantasy then you should definitely check out this trilogy or maybe you have someone in your life who is a fan of epic fantasy and you want to share this trilogy with them or this interview with them so that they can see if it's something they would be interested in um that would be great i would appreciate that very much um so thank you to tim thank you as always to you my listeners uh, i hope you will join me for my next interview i will be speaking with author garnett kilberg cohen about her short story collection it is called cravings there is a series of 10 or 12 short stories i don't remember off the top of my head i apologize but i will be speaking with her over the weekend and that that episode will be coming out on tuesday so join me for that in the meantime thank you so much for joining me for yet another episode of the gsmc book review podcast i appreciate you so much if you have not done so already uh, like subscribe follow on whatever platform you are consuming this podcast on that's very helpful also you can find the podcast on social media we are on facebook TikTok, instagram and x I love hearing from listeners, so please come find the podcast and by extension me. Let me know what you're reading. Let me know which authors uh, that I interview that you have read and just, just let me, you know, indulge my nosy side and tell me all about it. I hope that you have something wonderful planned for this weekend, but as always, my main wish for you is that you have plenty, plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you so much. Let's go. I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet. Damn, ain't that great. I don't wanna go.